righty, and uh, welcome into another Tuesday night. You know what that means if you've been a regular watcher or listener here. That means Connor and coverage. We're going to talk the latest Georgia news, recruiting notes, transfer portal now. I guess we have to introduce that into the equation as that is seemingly a, a weekly point of fascination. I'm sure we'll talk about that towards the end of the show tonight. There's maybe a little bit of rumblings, potentially some news coming out of there as well. Uh, I should introduce myself at some point here. My name is Connor Riley. I'm a writer here, staff writer for Dog Nation. Uh, even though it is the off season, news content never stops. We keep writing. We keep finding out ways to tell creative stories here at Dog Nation. Mike Griffith's out in California right now working on a ton of cool projects with regards to JT Daniels. So it's an exciting time. You know, obviously the season will be here sooner rather than later. I think as of Thursday, we're officially 100 days from the first game of the season, obviously a game against Clemson, which will, as of right now, be played at a full capacity crowd there in Charlotte, North Carolina. So we've got a ton of stuff to talk about tonight. June is just around the corner. That's going to be a big theme on tonight's show, or at least the main theme, so to speak of at the top here as I try to get my words right. June's a huge month, not just for for college football as a whole, but Georgia football in particular. We're going to talk about why that's the case. Obviously, recruiting comes to mind, but there are a couple other things lingering in the background that I think lend itself to being June, just being a very significant month for this Georgia program. We're going to talk a little bit. You know, I've written a couple stories this week talking about why freshmen aren't going to play as much, or not necessarily play as much, but be on be as counted on as much this year. And part of the reason I think you look at that is Georgia's got a number of redshirt freshmen who didn't get a chance to play a whole lot last year. And I think that's going to translate to some big-time playing time and big-time impact from some of these guys. And then we'll wrap things up talking about the two guys. And it would have been three guys that Georgia couldn't afford to lose, but Georgia already sort of lost one in George Pickens. And so, you know, keeping in line with depth and where Georgia stands there, we'll sort of wrap up there. And obviously take your questions, comments, things you want to know about the Georgia program, about what I know. Georgia baseball currently playing right now. As of right now, they've got a 4-1 lead on LSU. That's a huge game for them because there's a good chance that they can win that game and maybe even beat Arkansas tomorrow, something that they've already done this season. They can get back into that NCAA tournament. So big game for Scott Strickland. Thanks for tuning in on YouTube. Again, if you're a podcast listener, we do this live on YouTube every Tuesday night at 8. We've got a ton of stuff to talk about. And so without further ado, we're going to go with our main topic tonight, and that is is Georgia's new football facility because it is an $80 million facility, no expense spared, should be one of the best buildings and facilities in not just the SEC, but if you're one of those, you're also one of the best facilities in the entire sport. And I think that's really important for Georgia to get this off the ground, show it to people starting in June because June is a truly massive month. And so if you're watching on video right now, I'm going to pull up some video coming from the UGA football account where it's showing players and coaches sort of giving you the ultimate teaser of you see them reacting to it, but you don't actually get to see a whole lot from the actual facility itself and what's in there. So to give you an idea of what this facility contains and what's behind it, brand new locker room, brand new weight room, sports medicine was really put at the forefront of this in ways to help Georgia improve both physically and mentally. It's going to play a significant role in that. Ultimately, this is to help the players and want to encourage them, as you see guys like MJ Sherman, Kenny McIntosh, Dominic Blaylock, Ryland Goaty. And one interesting thing here is that a lot of the guys that were featured in sort of this teaser video for Georgia were guys who were mending and rehabbing from injuries. And I think that's significant and that this is going to help them, especially as you get into June, that's the start of Georgia football players returning to summer workouts. And because you have those returning workouts, it's going to be big as this team develops and tries to mold itself into a championship caliber program. And to have something like this, this brand new facility that you just saw players rave about, I think that's going to be really significant in terms of getting this team to where it needs to be. Obviously, there were a couple of significant injuries to this team in the spring practice period, as well as guys rehabbing from surgeries. And so to have this new facility, to have this new toys, these bells and whistles, I think it's going to make this Georgia program all the more attractive. And now, as you see on your screen, you see coaches reacting to it. And the timing of this is really interesting because Brandon Adams and I, we were sort of talking about this uh, off off air a few weeks ago. And we hadn't heard much about this new uh, football-only facility, $80 million. It had been expected to be completed after G-Day. And it was kind of interesting, the timing of it all, just because – you know, you would think Georgia would really want to put this out there and say, hey, look at this new facility that we've got. And that hadn't really been the case. And then so since this last week, since our last show, really, last Tuesday, Georgia's put out two new sort of teaser trailers. And I think a big reason why Georgia has been very secretive or quiet in terms of the rollout of this 
is they want to make it very appealing to recruits because as I think everyone here watches, or at least people who read Dog Nation know, the month of June is going to be a massive recruiting month. It is the first time that players will be back allowed on campuses since March of 2020 for Georgia because they were on spring break that first week in March there. This is going to be the first time that Georgia has hosted recruits since January of 2021, before National Signing Day for that 2020 class. To give you an idea there, Broderick Jones, a guy we're going to talk about a little bit later on here on a night show, he wasn't even officially a Georgia Bulldog yet. He had still not yet signed his letter of intent. Cedric Von Prahn, a guy who might be Georgia's starting center this year, had not yet signed his letter of intent the last time Georgia was able to host uh, recruits. And so you have that ability to once, to do that once again. And I think, like all schools, visits are important. But I think for Georgia in particular, the way they've been able to showcase and use visits to their advantage, it clearly, I think, means a good bit more to them, especially in the 2019 and 2020 cycles where they relied heavily on national prospects. Those visits are extremely significant. And you saw with the 2021 class and so far to start the 2022 class, they've been maybe a little bit more reliant on those in-state kids where they're not using the facilities and those visits as much to lure them in because location, I think, plays a bigger factor. But now that you're opening back up, you're going to be hosting visitors from all over the country. Uh, IMG's got a ton of kids coming up here. Kamari, Kamari Wilson, uh, Keon Sab, Tyler Booker, all from that IMG Academy of program. Evan Stewart, a wide receiver out of Texas as well, a name to know there. Richard Young, the number one running back in the 2023 class. Justin Tell's going to have you guys covered head to toe with the latest visitors and news and notes coming out of this pivotal June recruiting month. But to tie this football back to this brand new football facility that cost $80 million to build, this is going to be something that other schools can't quite do or can't quite replicate. You know, Alabama has their huge facility. Clemson has their huge facility. Georgia is opening up this brand new facility at the perfect time for this program because they're going to be able to entice or say to recruits, hey, we've got something you've never seen before. And I know a lot of these kids haven't had visits yet. But to see this brand spanking new building, I think that's a nice feather of the cap to have to Georgia to make this sort of pitch. Now, I don't expect a rash of commitments in the month of June. You might see a few in July and August as guys try to wrap their recruitments up before their senior seasons happen. But don't expect that first weekend a ton of recruits. In fact, I may be a little surprised if you see maybe even more than one commitment that first weekend there in the month of August. So this football facility – with the importance of the month of June, where you have recruits coming back on campus, you have players coming back and starting summer workouts. It is huge, not just for the future and the recruits, because obviously that was something that was always going to be pivotal with recruiting. It's something to be able to show and showcase to prospects. This $80 million facility is going to pay immediate dividends for this Georgia program, both in the very pivotal month of June for the 2022 recruiting class and for the summer workouts that players currently on the Georgia roster are going to go through the, in the months of June and July, and then obviously in August and September once the season gets kicked up and rolling around. So to have that in your bag as things in college football really seem to be returning to normal, you get the announcement that Clemson, Georgia is going to be a full capacity crowd. I imagine at some point later this summer, I'm not sure when, but you'll get that announcement that Sanford Stadium is going to be back to 93,000 fans. As college football starts to look more and more normal, Georgia's got a brand new spaceship to show off and to show to people that, hey, we now have the facilities to match what the rest of our competitors have. So in addition to all the other great stuff that makes Georgia one of the elite programs in college football, now it has a brand spanking new facility that it can show to players, that it can show to recruits, more importantly, to say, hey, we've got the top-of-the-line stuff that you want and you need. This is why you should come to the University of Georgia, in addition to everything else that this program has to offer. This brand new facility that players and coaches so far have been wowed out Wild about, I'm sure media members will get a chance to walk through there and see what it looks like. I'm sure no expense has been spared by the Georgia Athletic Department. Again, when you're building these facilities, you want to make them top of the line because it's sort of like buying a mattress. It's an investment. You're not going to update these all that much often, so you want to, when you buy it, get the best bang for your buck. Get the best possible purchase that you can have. Georgia has absolutely done that with this football-only facility, and it really opening up for the Georgia football program as the college football world opens up again could not be better timing for Georgia to showcase itself and show this is why we're one of the elite programs in the sport. And ultimately, if they, do, if they use this football facility properly and they play their cards right, it's going to play a role in Georgia winning, I think, a, a, a SEC championship, obviously in the college football playoff, national championship potentially, because it's going to propel them to where they need to be. And Nate and Kirby Smart can go back and show, hey, this is why elite facilities matter, because this new football-only facility 
helped us in a small way, obviously not a big way. It's still, at the end of the day, it comes down to players. It comes down to X's and O's. But this new facility, I think, if Georgia's going to win a national title, possibly even as early as this year, this football facility is going to play a role in how those players either come to Georgia or develop at the University of Georgia. And so this football-only facility, $80 million, will be well spent, especially as things continue to get more normal, and obviously the rest of the world, but the college football world in particular. So that's our first uh, subject for tonight, talking about that big new $80 million facility opening up. I'd say it's a soft opening, not like the Flamingo years. Flamingo Hotel one day was closed, the next day it was open. That's a little Ocean's 13 humor for you there. I'm sure no one watching this gets that reference. Anyway, we're going to move on to our second subject of the night here, redshirt freshmen. And so I wrote a, a story earlier this week. I'm going to have a, a companion to it later on in the week. I don't think, and it's more of an opinion, and I could certainly be proven wrong. I've been wrong before, and I'll be wrong again. I don't think you're going to see a lot out of Georgia's freshmen this year. As of right now, I think there may be only four guys you really hear from, at least in this 2021 season. I think it's a Marius Mims because I think he can be a factor at that left tackle. And really going forward, I think as this Georgia program continues to be built up, it's the Amarius Mims of the world who I think have the potential to make an early impact. Guys who are top 10, top 15 prospects who are just physical freaks. Uh, that, that's what I know everyone points to guys like Patrick Sertain or Minkin Fitzpatrick. Patrick Sertain was a top 10 overall prospect. Uh, J.C. Latham and, and Tommy Brockmeyer, guys who could be their starting right tackle for Alabama. Those are top 10 prospects. Those are the Amarius Mims is a top 10 prospect. Those are the kind of guys going forward I think you potentially see be impact players for Alabama. All right. I guess Mims is Georgia. Let's get our words right here. The other three guys are guys that fill sort of needs or or are one of ones. We'll start with the one of one. I think that's Brock Bowers. I don't think Georgia has another tight end that is capable of doing the things that Brock Bowers can do on the roster as of right now. And yes, Todd Hartley is recruiting the tight end position incredibly well, especially if they go out and land a guy like Oscar Delp in this 2022 recruiting class, and he will be visiting that first weekend there in June. But Bowers is a guy, very different skill set from Darnell Washington and John Fitzpatrick, sort of the more, I think, traditional tight end as opposed to the hulking monsters that Washington and Fitzpatrick are. And because of that, I think he's going to be able to play a little bit for Georgia early on in his career and offer something different and diversified skill set in this Georgia offense. Adonai Mitchell, I'm not going to ignore what he did in Georgia's spring game. I thought he played very well and showed, well, it wasn't a perfect day for Mitchell, and I think he would even tell you that himself. He showed that he is capable of making some plays, and if given an opportunity, I think he could do that for Georgia right away as a freshman. Clearly a guy who was not properly evaluated as a recruiting prospect, and that's not that, that might come off as an insult or, or a diss to the recruiting rankings. It's In a year where the pandemic was made everything hard enough, a guy, like, a guy as weird as the recruitment of Adonai Mitchell, where he didn't play high school football at all last year, reclassified to give himself a better chance of making it to the college level, and that's exactly what he did. He's just sort of a guy who slipped through the cracks, and I, I imagine you're going to have a lot of guys that come out of that 2021 recruiting class who sort of weren't properly evaluated just because of all the challenges of the pandemic. And then the last freshman that I really expect to play is Nyland Green, and I don't even know that could change here in the coming days and weeks. Say if Georgia does go out and land a, a, a cornerback in the transfer portal, and more specifically if they land a guy in Darian Kendrick who has starting experience and has played a Power Five level, I, I think if that happens, it moves a guy like. Nyland Green even further down the depth chart. And obviously didn't get a chance to play in the spring game because of COVID, so you wonder where he is at. Obviously there's competition at the top of that cornerback room. It sounds like Amir Speed, Jalen Kimber, and Keely Ringo have sort of separated themselves. And then if you add in a starter caliber player there in the transfer portal, I think Kendrick can do that as well. I would also bring up here, I think Brandon Turnage, George is going to try him at cornerback, whether or not he sticks and plays it right away. It's going to be interesting to watch, but Georgia, with no starting experience at the cornerback position right now, you're going to you're going to see at least in August, Nyland Green competing there as a possible starter. But that can change very quickly. But part of the other reason why I think the number of freshmen you're going to see down in terms of being contributors for this team is you even look back to the 2020 class, which statistically speaking was a better recruiting class than what Georgia brought in in 2021. I believe Georgia had the number two class. No, actually, I believe the number one overall class in 2021. And so last year, again, these kids, a lot of these kids came in during the summer, super weird setup in the height of the pandemic. Well, I guess technically the height was last January. But when things were at an all-time, are we even having a season? You know, what's this going to look like? Are we able to work out daily? How, how strange is everything? 
On top of that, you had a couple guys coming in with injuries. Arian Smith had a wrist injury that he had to have surgery on. Darnell Washington and Broderick Jones both had surgery before the start of August camp. Keely Ringo, obviously, at the very beginning of camp, has surgery on his labrum. Uh, Justin Robinson and Jalen Kimber both had injuries that they battled last year. So for a variety of reasons related to both the pandemic and health reasons, you didn't see a ton of guys that were regular contributors for Georgia in every game. Obviously, Jalen Carter was one. Marcus Rosemary Jack Saint would have been one, obviously, if not for the horrific or, uh, ankle injury. Mikhail Sherman is a guy who played a lot of special teams for Georgia, and I expect to see that going forward as well. But uh, I'm going to pull up the full screen here because I went through and actually did it. The list of scholarship players that are redshirt freshmen is actually pretty long and longer than it has been in years past for Georgia. And there's a number of guys on this list who are going to be starters for Georgia and a bunch more are probably going to be contributors. So to pull up the full list of names here, and it's a mouthful, you look at cornerback, Keely Ringo and Jalen Kimber. One of those guys I think is going to be your starting cornerback game one against Clemson. You look at the wide receiver position, Justin Robinson, Arian Smith, Ladd McConkey. All three of those guys – McConkey maybe not, but Robinson, as Mike Griffith has said, might be your starting X game one against Clemson. Arian Smith's speed is too good to keep him off the field. You're going to hear from him at some point this season. We'll skip. We'll come back to Carson back here a little bit because I do want to touch on him a little bit more. Tate Ratledge could be your starting right guard this season for Georgia, maybe even as early as that Clemson game. Roger Jones is going to push at both left and right tackle there. And then Cedric Von Prahn could be your starting center potentially later on in the season. And so you have a lot of names there that I think could play a significant role for Georgia at some point during this 2021 season and possibly even as soon as that Clemson game. You're going to see Kimber out there. You're going to see Arian Smith, Justin Robinson, Tate Ratledge certainly in that game one there against Clemson. Maybe Keely Ringo wins that starting cornerback job. Maybe Cedric Von Pond works his way into sort of the sixth man, sixth offensive lineman, seventh offensive lineman there. So you have a lot of players at a lot of different positions that for one reason or another didn't get a chance to make much of an impact this year. And I think that's going to partially eat into what we see from this freshman class. But because of this bigger crop than usual of redshirt freshmen, and again, these guys are guys who are listed as redshirt freshmen in the uh, Georgia Dogs media guide roster. So a, a good list here, I believe, as I try to do the math off the top of my head. 13 members of that 2020 Georgia signing class are redshirt freshmen. You're going to see at least four, five, maybe even six of these guys play significant snaps for Georgia in this 2021 season. And so because of that, you know, that's a number that you've seen that's bigger than where it has been in years past. You look last year, Warren McClendon comes to mind as a redshirt freshman that played a significant role for Georgia. But other than that, it wasn't this lit. The, the list of redshirt freshmen last year compared to this year is stark because I think this year has both guys that showed a little bit last year but were hampered by injuries or guys in front of them on the roster. But again, it's a talented group here. And I think you can expect to see contributions as early as that first game against Clemson from those redshirt freshmen. And so in part, that's going to eat into the guys you see there as freshmen playing right away, making significant contributions. But at the end of the day, I think this is maybe a model you sort of see for the next couple of years as sort of the weirdness of the transfer portal and COVID season impact the sport. This is not a short-term thing. I think this COVID season, it is a long-term thing. It is going to push guys further down the that chart as you have a few super seniors in the next couple of classes. For example, I think I'd say Justin Schaefer doesn't come back. Tate Ratledge might be your game one starter at right guard or – I said Justin Schaefer. Hopefully I did. Uh, if Justin Schaefer doesn't come back, Tate Ratledge might be your game one starter at right guard there for Clem against Clemson. Uh, you, obviously, Jalen Carter's not a redshirt freshman, but if Devontae Wyatt goes pro last season and doesn't take advantage of the super senior rule, I think you see Jalen Carter as a starter. If Demetrius Robertson doesn't come back, maybe you see an even bigger role for Arian Smith. That's going to be something that happens these next couple of seasons where – Guys take advantage of that, and that pushes guys, freshmen, further down the depth chart and means they have to redshirt and play an extra year or wait an extra year to get onto the field. And then factoring in the transfer portal as well, you're going to see teams, and Georgia is going to be one of them, that take guys for one year, take guys out of the transfer portal one or two years, guys like, say, Tyke Smith, who could go pro after the season, but guys who might have one or two years of eligibility. And so because you're bringing in, say, a Tyke Smith, that's going to prevent, say, a David Daniel, a uh, safety who Georgia signed in the 2021 class, from developing quicker and get and take thus take longer for a guy like David Daniel to get onto the field. So because of this transfer portal, because of the weirdness of the COVID season, I think this is a trend you're going to continue to see, obviously not just with the University of Georgia, but college football as a whole, where now 
you have elite programs having a greater number of redshirt freshmen just because of the greater roster numbers that are have been afforded because of the transfer portal and because of the COVID season. So you're going to see guys like Arian Smith, Keely Ringo, and I can tell you right now why I just said off the top of this segment that I think only four guys are regular contributors from Georgia's 2021 class. There's going to be a long list of redshirt freshmen next year for Georgia who, like those guys in the 2020 class, are going to make big impacts, I think, as redshirt freshmen. Say, a Shmael Munden, who may not have a straightforward path to playing time outside of special teams, but a year from now, Georgia may be asking him to be a starting uh, middle linebacker just because Kobe Dean is a junior who could certainly be gone after a strong season this year. Quay Walker is a senior. Channing Tindall is a senior. Those guys both have NFL-type measurables. So you're going to see some guys that maybe redshirt year one, say a Xavier Sori or a Dylan Fairchild, who redshirt their first year but are ready to make plays starting that redshirt freshman season. And I think at a place like Georgia, Alabama, Clemson, where that's not always the case, I think you're going to start seeing that a lot more going forward. So that's our second topic of the night. Uh, we've got one more thing before we wrap here, and then obviously questions to come at the end of there. So if you have questions, go ahead and post them in the YouTube chat. I'll do my best to answer them after this last little segment here. Again, this is Connor Riley. We're talking the latest in Georgia news, updates. Uh, Georgia baseball is currently playing right now. I don't know what the score is. It was 7-1 in the seventh inning, or 4-1 to in the seventh inning when I started. It would be a big game for Georgia to win. Uh, we've got a ton of uh, stories coming out of Mike Griffiths' trip to California. He's there doing some reporting on JT Daniels. That is going to be exceptional. And then the month of June, we sort of touched on it at the top of the show, but it's going to be a huge month for Georgia in, in terms of recruiting. And Jeff Sintel is going to get you guys all ready to go and ready to, to really understand what is going to unfold over the course of that month. And so because of that, we're going to move on and talk about, you know, I've written a story about, the best backup at every position for Georgia. And a number of those retro freshmen you just saw or heard were guys that I think could certainly be that. And I, I, in sort of spinning this forward, I thought something Jeff had brought up last year, who is the most indispensable player on this Georgia team guys that if they lose them to injury, there isn't a ready-made replacement because Devonte Wyatt theoretically could go down to an injury and you hope that it doesn't happen. But you feel pretty comfortable if, say, Jalen Carter steps in right there as the backup defensive tackle. Uh, if Justin Schaefer or Jamari Sawyer are down, you feel pretty good about what uh, Tate Ratledge or an Amarius Mims might be able to give you. But that's not the case for this entire roster. And so because of that, our final sort of subject here for tonight is the most indispensable players on Georgia's team, the guys they can't afford to go down. I think last year you saw arguably two of their more indispensable players. And if you want to count Jamie Newman in there as well, I think you certainly can all go down with injuries or, in Newman's case, choose to opt out because Georgia didn't have backups that were able to replicate what they were able to give behind them. Richard LeCount, it's obvious. You, you go look at that forward again. For at the week after he goes down in a traffic accident and was essentially a season-ending injury, Georgia gives up 44 points, 470 passing yards. Those were both career high or season highs, and I believe actually – if you exclude the double overtime game against Oklahoma, the most points Kirby Smart has ever given up and the most yards, passing yards Kirby Smart's defense have ever given up since he took over in 2016. So a guy like Richard LeCount, Georgia couldn't cover rear outs. I imagine if Richard LeCount is out there, they have a much better time. One of the most indispensable players on this Georgia team this year actually was, I think, an answer to that last year, and he did go down. Jordan Davis went down with an elbow injury in that Kentucky game. And while the Georgia defense didn't suffer a ton statistically in his absence, Georgia still led the SEC and in the country in rush defense. And that Florida game, if you go back and watch that first half, Florida was able to grind out four and five yard carries and in four and five yard rushes. And Florida was not a good rushing team last season. And I think that's actually part of the reason why I am not so high on them this year. Unless Emory Jones is just truly a dynamic running force that really forces teams to defend them a different way. Uh, but in terms of running back production last year, Florida was not great in that area. And yet they were able to do enough offensively in the first half to where you had to respect it. You couldn't just drop guys into coverage. And Florida was able to take advantage of that. And uh, Georgia, and quite frankly, I don't know if there's another Jordan Davis in all of college football. He is a massive human being, easily the best run defender in the sport. And if he's able to give you some stuff as a pass rusher too this year, which we've seen in flashes, and I think you're going to see during this season, because every time that Kirby Smart has challenged Jordan to get in shape, like he has in years past, Jordan's done it. Jordan's done everything that you want to see from this Georgia, from this team. And he is a leader for this program. And I think he's going to play a huge role for Georgia in this 2021 season. 
But he's a guy Georgia can't afford to lose because as much as you might like Devontae Wyatt or as much as you like, like say, a Jalen Carter or even a Zion Logue, there just isn't another Jalen Carter out there for Georgia. And so they need him to stay healthy and to make a positive impact. The other guy, and it's obvious, it's, it's JT Daniels. Uh, he is quarterback one. He could be the best quarterback in the sport. It would not surprise me if he has that kind of season for Georgia this year. He is everything I think a championship quality team looks for in a quarterback. Made that offense significantly better. They go score, I think, nine more points a game. Are throwing for 100 more yards a game as soon as it goes from Stetson Bennett and Dewan Mathis to JT Daniels as your starting quarterback. And the depth behind him, while it's intriguing long-term with guys like Carson Beck and Brock Vandergriff, and you do have a proven backup in Stetson Bennett, if JT Daniels goes down, Georgia's not, Georgia's not accomplishing its goals. It's not winning the SEC. It's not winning the college football playoff. And really, if Daniels has to miss a significant chunk of time, you sort of at that point have to start saying to yourself, all right, we need to start evaluating Carson Beck and Brock Vandergriff as their futures are sort of the thing we have to worry about now. Uh, Daniels is that important. Again, you look at a lot of teams in recent seasons. You look back to Alabama in that uh, 2019 season. Tua goes down with an injury, and while they very nearly could have made the playoffs with Mac Jones, that season was over the second Tua went down, and then ultimately uh, Alabama loses to Auburn, and that ends up being the case. I think you look last year. Jamie Newman, look, we'd ne- we will never know what he could have been in this Georgia offense. You could told me he would have stunk. You could told me he would have been great and, and played his way into being a high draft pick. But the second Georgia lost him and JT Daniels wasn't fully ready to go and then the season starts and it's just, you know, it's sort of a mess at the quarterback position. I think that's a fair, fair assessment to say of what we saw at the beginning of last season from the Georgia quarterback position. So you have all that. And, you know, look, I still don't think Georgia wins a national title. I still don't even think Georgia makes the playoff last year with Jamie Newman just because that Alabama team was so good. And at the end of the day, Georgia, I think, was going to have multiple losses to Alabama. And having the two in your loss column, I think, would have kept you out over a Notre Dame, over a Ohio State, over a Clemson, the other teams that made the college football playoff last season. So, I, I again, that just goes to show you in the modern day of college football, you need an elite quarterback or a quarterback who is, at the very least, very, very good that has an incredible set of weapons around him to lead you to these college football playoff games. It's not a coincidence that you look at the last two national championship games, not even the the college football playoff, but the specific title games. Because, sure, making the college football playoff this year would be nice for Georgia to say, hey, we took a step forward this year. At Sooner or later, Georgia's going to have to win that national title. So why not do it this year? We're in Alabama, Ohio State – and Clemson are all reloading at quarterback. Now, when those teams get to the playoffs, they won't be reloading at quarterback anymore. DJ Ewing Ungle won't be an unknown at that point in the season. Bryce Young, uh, I imagine CJ Stroud is going to be Ohio State starting quarterback. Those guys are going to be known entities at that point in the season. But I, I, I think what makes Daniels, again, you, you, just, you just saw it was night and day difference last year when he steps in as the starting quarterback. And so if you have that, Georgia's got a chance again. It, it, I would expect. Let's God forbid something terrible happens. I'm gonna knock on wood here. Let's say JG Daniels does have to miss the Clemson game for some reason. You know, I, I we wrote today. You see a three and a half, three uh, as Georgia's an underdog there. That number is gonna balloon up to at least seven and maybe even ten if Daniels isn't ready to go. And again, this isn't to say that he won't be, but if theoretically he is that important to Georgia, he is someone who drastically swings lines and drastically changes the trajectory and ceiling of this program. I always thought Daniels was going to be the starter for Georgia in 2021. I think they wanted to see Newman clearly win the job, take the job for that 2020 season, allow Daniels to get fully healthy, fully ready to go, and then turn it over to him for 2021. But we got a nice little taste of what Daniels is going to be capable of doing at the end of the 2020 season. And because of that, he showed why he is so important and why having players Quarterback specifically, like JT Daniels, is so, so, so important to being a championship team. And at the end of the day, that is the expectation that Georgia will have to live up to season in and season out. And JT Daniels is clearly that. He's a big reason why, even though Georgia has questions in terms of what happens without George Pickens, because George Pickens absolutely is an indispensable player, but Georgia sort of already lost him for a significant portion of the season and maybe the entire year. We'll see where his recovery is and if he's able to get back on the field. 
But Daniels is a guy you can't lose. He, he has to play every snap of the season for you. Unfortunately, Richard LeCount didn't get a chance to do that last year. Jordan Davis didn't as well. So you, Georgia needs to be able to keep a guy like JT Daniels, who does have a history of knee injuries, upright, playing, and making a difference for Georgia. Obviously, you know, Georgia, Georgia shouldn't need JT Daniels to beat a South Carolina, to beat a Kentucky, to beat a Missouri. But at games against like Clemson, Alabama in the SEC championship game, Ohio State in the college football playoff, those are the games you need JT Daniels. And that's why you know, I'll, I'll end here on George Pickens because I do think he could come back for that SEC championship game. I do think he could come back for the college football playoff if that is something that he elects to do, both in terms of declaring for the NFL draft, something he could certainly do, or just in terms of taking his rehab seriously enough to where he's in, on track to get on the field in those November games and then get that knee and feel confident in that knee, because as much as we've talked about Jermaine Burton here, Marcus Rosemey, Jack Saint, Arian Smith, there isn't another wide receiver on this Georgia roster like George Pickens, capable of doing the things that George Pickens has done. That's why if George Pickens was healthy, he'd be the number one wide receiver in the country for, I think, the 2021 NFL draft. So George has already lost, I think, one of the more indispensable players. Davis, maybe you're able to weather it, just given how strong the rest of that defensive line and front seven is. But the answer is JT Daniels, without a doubt, in terms of who is the most indispensable player for Georgia, the guy they absolutely can't have, they can't afford to have miss any snaps or any significant time. So that's our third segment for tonight. We'll move on to questions here. Uh, Shoot them if you got them. We'll answer your questions uh, as we sort of wrap up here. We'll try to do a good five minutes here, an actual five good minutes, not the BA. Y'all do five minutes, and it turns into 15 with the – Comment section going off the rails as it tends to do on YouTube. Uh, let's see. Questions, comments. Um, let's see. Uh, I mean, Michael Tiffany uh, says he doesn't see Demetrius Roberts hitting too much in a playing time for other receivers. You know, D-Rob did have a long touchdown catch in that game against – or in the spring game, and he made a nice third down catch there on the sideline. Uh, I believe it was the Mississippi State game. JT Daniels made some big third down throws to Robertson in that game. Uh, I, I know people want to see Arian Smith. They want to see Jermaine Burton. Obviously, uh, Dominic Blaylock and Marcus Rosemary Jack Saint, what they look like coming back from injuries. But Demetrius Robertson, I think, has a role on this team. I, I, I If Georgia did not want him back – he would not be on this team. I think they wanted him. They saw value in having a veteran like Demetrius Robertson here for another season, as we sort of saw in the spring with the rash of injuries that can happen at any moment. You've seen it at other positions in years past. So having a body like Demetrius Robertson, who you know obviously didn't live up to the hype or expectations that were set for him, but I think he can still be a quality player for Georgia and could at some point make a difference-making play in a big game where Georgia absolutely needs him to. Uh, Ryland plays ask Connor, which draft eligible, eligible dog makes himself the most money with this play in 2021. The easy answer here is JT Daniels, because if he does what he did at the end of last season, replicates it over the full course of the 2021 season and makes small improvements, I think he can go and be a first round pick. But the actual answer to me for me for this question is Trayvon Walker hasn't played a ton, played in flashes, played in spurts. But I think he's going to be put in a position this year by the Georgia defensive coaching staff to make a huge impact from that defensive end position. And if he does that, when you factor in the absurd athleticism that he has, I mean, this is a guy who, at 290 pounds, 280 pounds, is running down there on kickoffs. That's something I, frankly, have never seen in football. This guy is a rare athlete, and if he brings the production to match that, he's absolutely going to be a three-and-out player for Georgia. And if he does that, this Georgia defense is going to be something serious to where we're not wondering – how does Georgia go about replacing Aziz or Delari or Jermaine Johnson? Because I think Trayvon Walker is a guy who can definitely do that. Uh, let's see. Yeah, Harry Lloyd, Clemson is a big test in the first game. It, I agree here. It does set the pace of the season, or at least the, the tone surrounding it. Because you win that game, while well, Georgia is clearly, I think, one of the elite teams in college football this season, capable of beating anybody and really a force to be reckoned with. And then, obviously, the long-term ramifications of that. If you win the rest of the games on your SEC schedule, which, quite frankly, looking at it right now, Georgia should absolutely do that. If you're 12-0, and an SEC East champion, heading into that SEC championship game with a win over Clemson, who's probably going to run the table in the ACC this year, or at the very least is expected to, is their over-under, is 11.5. I mean, I don't want to say it's a guarantee that Georgia's in the college football playoff, but... 
it'd be pretty hard to make a case for them not to get into the playoff unless, say, JT Daniels were to get hurt and then Georgia gets blown out in the SEC championship game by, theoretically, Alabama because I think that's the team that Georgia will see in the SEC championship game. But barring a true disaster scenario that strikes in the Georgia Tech game, if, you're, if Georgia's 12-0 and with that win over Clemson heading into the SEC championship game, they're going to be in a great spot for the college football playoff. Uh, let's see. Uh, HMAC3, Scene Smith, Turnage, Speed, and Transfer Smith. Uh, that, that is Tyke Smith, uh, and I'm guessing Christopher Smith. Starting secondary. I'll push back there a little bit. I, I think Jalen Kimber is going to be a starting cornerback in that first game against Clemson. Obviously, he's got to continue to put on weight. That is always going to be the biggest issue, sort of the opposite of Jordan Davis, a really good player, but weight and putting in, in getting physical and being thick. That has been his sort of calling card of the thing he's always needed to improve on. And I think, and it wouldn't surprise me if Georgia goes out and goes into the transfer portal and brings in a cornerback with obvious starting experience at a power five level. And some name could come up and be a, a bigger name than Darian Kendrick right now. But if Darian Kendrick is the best cornerback available in the transfer portal, and obviously he has some off-field things he has to deal with, arrested on a handgun, uh, Ill illegal possession of a handgun and some marijuana charges. If, if he can get those sorted out, I think there's a good chance you see him at Georgia. And if you see him at Georgia and he's on the Georgia roster, he's starting game one against Clemson, which is going to be a very, very interesting dynamic going into that game because Georgia Clemson obviously play week one. Kendrick was a two-year starter, dismissed from the team, had some disciplinary issues there. It's going to be really fascinating to see if Georgia does end up landing Kendrick, what that impact long-term ends up looking like. And uh, by the way, Georgia baseball, 4-1 win over LSU. That is very, very big for them. If They're going to make the NCAA tournament. Obviously, I think a win over Arkansas tomorrow really seals it for them, but that's a huge win. LSU is a similar bubble team, and you know, hats off to Scott Strickland this year. I don't know if there's a team in the country, football, baseball, basketball, whatever you want to say it, that got a worse deal from COVID because – when, when COVID shut everything down, Georgia Baseball, the number two, or I believe the number three team in the country, two stud pitchers in Emerson Hancock, and, and uh, he, play, he pitches for the Rays, Cole Wilcox. Uh, both those guys obviously go and get drafted, and Georgia goes from a team that is a top five team in the sport to a team that sort of always knew 2021 was going to be a rebuilding year for them. And so they can make this tournament this year in a loaded SEC that saw them beat Vanderbilt, take a series off them, win a game against, say, Florida Ole Miss. This Georgia baseball team is extremely young, and they've shown they can beat anybody, unfortunately, and the reason they're ultimately on the bubble is because they can ultimately also lose to anybody. And so for them to beat LSU today is huge. Big performance out of the pitching staff where they gave up a run in the first inning and then eight shutout innings after that. So big kudos to the Georgia baseball team today. Uh, Ryland Phillip, Ryland plays, and this will probably be my last question. Uh, well, actually, all right. So, Bubby Dean asked, "Does Carroll get on the field in the defensive backfield against Clemson?" I'm assuming you mean Lavasier Carroll. I don't think we're going to see Lavasier Carroll get on the field. Uh, a lot of bad things would have to happen to Georgia's cornerback depth uh, for that to be the case for Carroll. I think that was maybe just a spring solution where because they were so thin at the cornerback position, that's why they moved Lavasier over there. I don't know if that's a long-term move for the four-star running back in the 2021 class. Uh, and then to go back to Ryland's question, it is a concern. Uh, it's certainly going to be a concern in that first game against Clemson, but even long-term than that, Georgia's got to find an offensive line that's capable of doing things that Alabama's offensive line did last year. You saw guys like Evan Neal, Alex Leatherwood, Landon Dickerson, uh, just a loaded offensive line. At the start of this season, on May 25th, as of right now, Georgia's current starting offensive line, or at least what I expect it to be, is not on that Alabama level. It's not on that 2019 LSU level. It's certainly not on that 2017, 2018, even 2019 Georgia offensive line level. It's got a ways to go to get there. Now, I think it has the players to do it. Uh, Amarius Mims is going to be a stud. I really like what Tate Ratledge brings as an offensive guard. Obviously, Jamari Sawyer, I think he's one of the five best offensive linemen in the conference. Georgia's got just got to find a way to play him at the place where he makes the rest of the offensive line better. Game one, I don't think that I do think this is going to be a big issue. I think Georgia's got the talent to sort it out. It's just going to be a matter of if and when the pieces come together on the offensive line for Georgia's offensive line to get to where it needs to get to. So, uh, great questions uh, tonight, guys. Had a great time talking with you. That'll do it. We've hit the 40 minute mark here 
on Connor and coverage. You've got Jeff Sintel Wednesday night talking the latest in Georgia recruiting. He's going to get you geared up for what will be a huge month of visits in the month of June. Officials, unofficials, guys in both the 2022, 2023 classes coming in. Should be a mammoth recruiting month there. Obviously, we've got a ton of stuff with Mike Griffith out there in California to continue to roll in. You have to hear uh, from his high, uh, JT Daniels high school coach last night on On the Beat. You've got Brandon Adams every Monday through Friday. Going to be a fun set of shows as we make it through the offseason and try to make it fun and entertaining for you guys. And obviously, no cover for this week. We had one last week, so no cover for on Thursday. But thanks again for everyone tuning in. My name is Connor Riley. This has been Connor and Coverage. Have a great Tuesday. Have a great rest of the week. Memorial Day this weekend. Let's go out there and have some fun. If you're vaccinated, things are opening back up. Georgia got the announcement that its game against Clemson is going to be played at full capacity. Things continue to look more normal. So thanks again, everyone, for tuning in tonight. I had a great time chatting. We'll be back here next Tuesday, 8 p.m. as well. You can get us on the podcast feed, uh, Dog Nation podcast feed on Spotify, SoundCloud, Apple, Google Play, wherever you get your podcast, you can get this podcast on there. Thanks again for tuning in. My name is Connor Riley. This has been Connor and Coverage.